evening, good evening, and welcome to Girlfriend Therapy Radio. Welcome to SFP Media Network. I am incredibly excited to be here. Um, I told you guys Thursdays really have become one of my favorite days of the week. The only thing I don't like about Thursday is that I always feel like I'm exhausted. <laughs> By the time I get on air, I just, I've not quite figured out how to slow my days down or even to slow the week down, because I think by Thursday, I start winding down anyway. Um, And and Friday, you know, it's pretty much a wrap. So, but welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm super excited to be here. Got a lot of great things to talk about today. Um, As you guys know, um, if you've been following us on social media, (laughs) as you guys know, the message for today or the topic that we're going to talk about um, in my second segment, which is the topic of the day, uh, we're going to talk about battle ready. Um, So we'll get into that. But first, as you guys know, and I'm kind of regretting it, I I say it like with a sigh, (laughs) as you guys know, I actually decided um, in the second season of Girlfriend Therapy Radio that I would do and talk about top trending topics. And so what this segment is, is really me just kind of looking at the news and seeing what's going on, you know, what's, uh, you know, what's being reported, what's kind of out there in the, uh, in the, on the airwaves and the news reports and all that. And so the last few weeks I actually talked about, I think the first week, I can't believe we're just in like week four of September. Um, it feels like I've been doing this much, much longer. But I think the first week we talked about, you know, the DACA reform and all of that. We kind of, you know, talked a little bit about that. And then for the second and third week, we actually talked about tornado, uh, tornado hurricanes and earthquakes and all those different things. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of that is still going on. As I understand it, Puerto Rico is still without power which is insane, Um, but I understand that, you know, uh, relief efforts are on the way. A lot of people, like civilians, are doing a lot to really try to help um, remedy, you know, um, some of the loss, so that's amazing to see people really coming together and donating and, you know, uh, putting their money where their mouth is and really doing stuff to help make an impact. Um, And so tonight, I, I really, you guys have no idea, I really didn't want to talk about this tonight. I actually did a video on Monday um, to say, hey, hopefully I don't have to talk about this on Thursday because I really didn't want to. But I did have to talk about it for a couple of reasons. So first reason is because when I did my video on Monday, I had a couple of my facts wrong. And, um, you know, so uh, some people told me like, well, that wasn't exactly the case. That wasn't actually what it was. And so this is kind of me, you know, after doing a little fact checking, or just really a little research, basically. Um, This is me just kind of coming back to talk about, uh, as I let out a heavy sigh, um, talking about, you know, uh, Colin Kaepernick, talking about the NFL boycott and the national anthem and all of the protests that has been going on like all weekend, and then a lot of the debate and a lot of the discussion that's been going on all week. And so that's what we're going to talk about for tonight's top trending topic. Now, so when I talked about it on Monday, I kind of was trying to pull the pieces together and figure out like what's really going on. So I'm going to try to do like a chronology, not going too far deep uh, at that, but just kind of putting things in chunks so we can understand what's going on. Because I think right now people are just in protest mode and they have no idea what they're protesting, why they're protesting. They're just fist in the air protesting. So from my assessment, there are like three main things that's happening here. So the first thing, which is Colin Kaepernick's protest. Now, this protest started, I, it had to be maybe last winter, I think, maybe um, the winter of 2016, fall of 2016 time frame, probably about a year ago. Um, and so his protest was in response to um, the police brutality and police killing of unarmed you know, black and brown men and women. And so in protest to that, Colin Kaepernick decided that he would do a silent protest. And then instead of um, standing during the national anthem, he decided, initially decided that he would sit. And then after getting, and he did this like, I think in a preseason game, if I understand correctly. So after I think like the first or maybe by the third preseason game, um, from what I understand, I think he uh, got a little, seek a little counsel. And his counsel suggested that, you know, to sit is disrespectful, but what you want to do is take a knee. That's a little, you know, that, you know, that's more respectful and and people will understand that more. 
And so in response to, this, to the advice that he got, uh, Colin Kaepernick decided that he would take a knee as opposed to sitting during the national anthem. And I was reading an article because there was actually a gentleman who started this, um, this, this protest with uh, Colin, or it didn't start, but at some point, maybe probably by the third game or so, um, preseason game. Um, I can't think of the individual's name, so I do apologize, but he kind of joined Colin Kaepernick in this, um, in this protest. And so the article that I was reading, the guy said, you know, when uh, we sat um, and then the advisor, whoever it was, told them, you know, don't sit because that's disrespectful, kneel. He said, you know, we looked at kneeling as a sign of kind of like um, he, he, he referenced or um, um, related it to when you do like fly, fly the flag at half mast. So he kind of thought of it in that way. So, you know, it's still respecting the um, – you know, respecting what it means, but also showing, hey, there's some distress here, there's some duress here. Um, and so as a result of that duress, I, you know, hence the protest, I'm going to take a knee as opposed to standing and putting my hand on my heart and all that stuff. So that was Colin Kaepernick's, um, that was his stance. So fast forward, I guess, you know, got through the season, you know, there was a lot of energy, momentum, you know, a lot of attention on the fact that he was kneeling during the national anthem, had some players, you know, other people had different things, uh, uh, points of view and different thoughts about it, which was fine. Um, but he continued to protest in a way that he felt he wanted to protest. So fast forward at the end of the season, I guess, when teams were picking up, um, picking up their players, uh, Colin Kaepernick was not picked up by any team. And so people became outraged and offended and upset over the fact that the NFL had not picked Colin Kaepernick up for, I guess, the 2017, 2018 football season. And so um, as a result of that, people began to protest the NFL's um, treatment of Colin Kaepernick. So you have one protest, which is Colin Kaepernick protesting police brutality against um, in the killings of unarmed black and brown men and women. Then the second thing that came out of that protest was people protesting the NFL's um, treatment of Colin Kaepernick because of the way that he decided to protest. And so before the season began, there was this whole, you know, uh, I think it was hashtag uh, boycott the NFL or hashtag NFL boycott or something like that. So there was already this movement to boycott the NFL because they hadn't picked up Colin Kaepernick to play on any of the teams. So there was already this boycott in works and people had already, you know, kind of raised their hand and said that I would boycott, you know, kind of thing. Um, and I'm not a football fan. I don't watch football. I know very deep. I don't even know anything. I'm just going to say very little. I don't know anything about football. So um, it was easy for me to say, yeah, sure, I'll boycott, the, boycott football, you know, because I really uh, stood for and, and believed in what Colin Kaepernick was protesting. And so, and I, I agree based on all reports that, you know, if he was a good, um, a good football player, there was no other reason in the world why he shouldn't have been picked up. And so I agreed with, you know, with, with the protest of uh, boycotting the NFL for that reason. Now, all of this is, is in motion. You know, we start, the, the first season game kicks off, and I don't know what came first. I guess I should have uh, researched it, but it really doesn't matter because the only part that I really want to focus on um, is a, apparently in, in the midst of all of this, 45 <laughs> threw a flag and called foul. And so he threw the flag, called foul, and pretty much kind of um, uh, uh, demanded, suggested, highly suggested, I don't know how you want to say it, that NFL um, owners uh, start um, firing <laughs> players who decided that they would not stand during the national anthem. <clears throat> and his words went something to the effect of, you know, is it disrespecting our flag, is disrespecting our country, is unpatriotic, all of these um, inflammatory words that, of course, when people hear unpatriotic, they don't even know what else is going on. They just jump on a bandwagon. And so now there's all this protest and all of this Facebook beef and Twitter beef about, you know, um, you know, Colin Kaepernick being unpatriotic and uh, people that support him is unpatriotic and, you know, it's disrespectful to the men and women in uniform and all of these different narratives. And I'm just like, where the heck did all that come from? And of course, it came from 45, as I called him, the king of derailment. Um, like he is a, a master derailer. Like he loves to throw stuff out there, watch it go up in smoke and fire and all that stuff. 
And what's unfortunate to me is that it doesn't seem like people are in tuned enough to follow what's going on. And it's crazy. I was listening to one of my favorite radio shows and they had people calling in asking, you know, for them to share their thoughts on the protests and all of that. And they had one caller, she called in, bless her heart. She was like, I think it's disrespectful. And so one of the radio hosts said, well, what, what, what do you think is disrespectful? Well, I think it's disrespectful to the flag. It's disrespectful to the men and women in uniform um, for, uh, for someone to not stand during the national anthem. And so one of the radio hosts, he said, um, well, do you understand why Colin Kaepernick took a knee in the first place? And she's like, well, um, she didn't know. She was like, um, no. <laughs> So he began to explain to her why Colin Kaepernick took the knee in the first place. And I think that's one of the main issues is that people don't know what they're protesting. And at this point, it is just just a mess. It is literally just a mess. I mean, there are people, like I said, Facebook wars, Twitter beef, all of this stuff taking place because people really, one, don't know what they're pro- what, what's being protested, two, um, it's not like people are just like picking up their 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 uh uh, uh their uh what is it like their little protest their their what is the word like picking up their protest signs or whatever um and not really understanding why you know they're just looking at it like oh you're disrespecting the military and all this stuff and just really not understanding why I think that um and I said this in my video on Monday I really think that um. What Colin Kaepernick is protesting is very fair, and I would say that as a, you know, as a as a wife, um, as a mother, as a sister, as a daughter, um, as a cousin, as a friend, as an African American woman who have African American men in my life, I would say that what Colin Kaepernick is protesting, I am absolutely 100% in agreement. And the way that he chooses to protest, I get it. Like, I totally get it. And let me say, by the way, I was former military. I was in the military. And I think that I would still feel the same way. Like, I'm not making in my mind the connection of Colin Kaepernick's protest, connecting that with being disrespectful to the military or the men and women in service or even the flag. I'm not making that mental connection um, at all. Like, I recognize that these are totally like three totally different protests and I think the most destructive of the three like Colin Kaepernick taking a knee that's not destructive that's not disruptive it's silent it's a silent protest um the other players or not even the other players I guess the other players started uh, responding to 45 and so in response to that a lot of people started taking the knee and all that um but I think you know, the, the protests against the NFL, hashtag boycott NFL or hashtag NFL boycott, whatever one it was, um, I think that's fair because I think that the way that the NFL handled Colin Kaepernick was not fair. And so I think it's very fair for people who support the sport um, to protest, to say, hey, we don't agree with the way that you treated him. Um, I can't imagine in either of those accounts, I can't imagine someone saying, that no police killing unarmed black and brown men is justified. I can't imagine someone 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 educated um, agreeing that that is justified. And I can't really uh, um, agree with someone who to say that is not justified for people to say that they don't support the way the NFL handled Colin Kaepernick's person, protest. Um, but so either neither one of those. And my vantage point, neither one of those really was the issue. The issue came when 45 threw a foul in a game and made these claims and these statements that just simply were not factual. So those are my thoughts um, with this thing. And I, I think if I had to leave with anything positive or anything encouraging, you know, I would just say, one, um, the flag and everything that it represents absolutely represents freedom, not just freedom for people to live and freedom to be treated fairly, but also freedom for people to protest. And if you are just protesting or anti just for the sake of being against something, you really ought to examine your motives, examine your your thinking, examine 
stressful situation, understand what you're protesting. Um, that, that, those are just my thoughts. And if you don't have a dog in a fight, if you don't feel passionate about, you know, either one way or the other, then if you don't have to debate just for the sake of debate. And I think that's what we're seeing a lot of now is people just debating. And I mean, just so much commentary and a lot of it is, is um, misguided and um, simply not true. So if I had to say anything, one, if you don't understand it, um, seek to understand it. Two, if it doesn't affect you, don't deny the fact that it affects a lot of people. Um, and three, you educate yourself. I think, I mean, just really educate yourself about what's going on. And, and I think that's all I'm going to say about it. As far as I'm concerned, um, I stand with Colin Kaepernick in his protest. Um, and that, you know, I, I just do because I 100% I, I agree what with the with why he's protesting and agree that something needs to be done so those are my thoughts on the top trending topics talking about kaepernick nfl boycott and the national anthem and oh by the way let me say this because um i i kind of think that the whole idea the fact that there was already this boycott nfl um and people were already pre prepared not to watch it or support it um until they did something different I think a lot of those numbers were going to be there, whether 45 said anything or not. And so I think I'm noticing that the news reports are trying to attribute um, the, the, the lack of participation and all that, trying to attribute to that to 45, you know, making the declaration and stop supporting it. I, um, I call foul on that. I don't think that that's the case. So those are my thoughts on the top trending topic for tonight. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to jump into our topic and we're going to talk about battle ready. So we're going to take a break, and we will be right back. So we are back ready to jump into tonight's topic. Um, 
Uh, like I said, if you guys follow me on social media, I'm going to keep saying that until you guys follow me on social media. <laughs> but if you guys follow me on social media, then you would know tonight um, we're going to talk on a topic of battle ready. And continuing just in this series um, on spiritual warfare, uh, battle ready is, is um, I think, a topic that we are kind of transitioning and working ourselves into. And so I want to talk about that tonight. What does it look like? What does it mean? For the believer to be battle ready. Now, you guys may not know this, but I actually, well, you do know it because I just mentioned it earlier. But um, I spent time in the military. I did just under eight years in the Army. And I remember, you know, I, I, when I was thinking about this topic, of course, I was thinking about like basic training and thinking about when you first, you know, came, um, uh, you know, came into the military and got to your first or your basic training station. I'm sorry, before you went into, uh, you know, the training and all that stuff that's, well, basic training, hence the word basic. So <laughs> uh, when I first got there, one of the first things that they did was um, issue our equipment. And they issued our uniforms, they issued, um, you know, our boots, they issued our hat, our helmet, our cap, like all those, everything that we needed to be battle ready. Um, and they issued our weapon. And so all of that was like a big deal. And I can remember when I first got, um, you know, got issued all of my, my gear, it was like, at that point, I felt official. It was like, I, it's officially, you know, I am in the military. So it felt really good to uh, have all of my equipment and to be battle ready. And so when I thought about tonight's topic, talking about battle ready, um, you know, I, I, I started thinking about that experience and also thought about what does it mean to be battle ready? Um, so battle ready is a phrase used by like uh, sword enthusiasts. So when they're talking about like a functioning sword, they talk about it in terms of it being battle ready. But battle red ready also, just by definition, um, it, it means to be ready to be sufficiently trained and strong to engage the enemy. So sufficiently trained and strong, strong enough to engage the enemy. And so when we think battle ready in sense in the terms of uh, the spiritual warfare, um, it really is uh, prepared to be used of God. That's that's like a classic, basic understanding of what battle already means when we're talking in a spiritual. It means prepared it to be used by God. Um, and so the foundation scripture, if you guys remember when we first started this series, I had two foundation scriptures. And the, uh, the second one was Ephesians 6 and 10. And the other one is one I talked about last week, um, which was, which was it, which was it, which was it? Um, 2 Corinthians 10. Um, yeah, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6 was the foundation scripture, or the scripture that we talked through last week. But week one, um, I announced the two foundation scriptures was the 2 Corinthians scripture and then also the Ephesians 6 and 10 scripture. And so tonight, we're going to talk about battle ready as um, um, using the foundation scripture of Ephesians 10 or Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. And so I'll read the scripture, and then we're going to just jump right in. So it says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil, the devil's scheme. And, and it reiterates um, that, you know, our fight is not against flesh and blood, but it is against, um, but it's a spiritual fight. And then it goes on to say, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm. And it, now it starts talking about the, 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 um, your, your, your um, armor. And it says, stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel, um, gospel of peace. And it says, take up the shield of faith with which, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the, in, of the evil one. And it says, take on the helmet of salvation, and then lastly, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And so... When they're talking about what it looks like to be battle ready, when they're talking about what your armor looks like, you know, they're talking about the, the, the uh, what they say, the belt of truth buckled around your waist, the breastplate of righteousness in place, um, your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. It says, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinct, with which you can extinguish all the flying, flaming arrows of the evil one. And it says, take the helmet of salvation, and then lastly, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And so we're going to just dissect this kind of like we did last week, but I want to just kind of talk about each of the, um, 
the armor that, you know, that God tells us to wear when we go into spiritual warfare, when we go into spiritual battle. And so the first thing it says, it says, put on the whole armor of God. And that is all of the proper defenses afforded us through our, our faith and through Christ Jesus. So everything that Christ did on the cross, that is what we're putting on. When we talk about um, righteousness and all of that, um, and, and we put this on, you know, so that we can fight against and repel the tricks and the tactics of the enemy. You guys remember first week I talked about the um, um, uh, agents of the enemy, and I talked about some of the lies and the tactics that the enemy used. And so we put on our full, ar- full armor of God so that we can fight against those tactics um, that the enemy uses. And it goes on to say, you know, um, that we're encouraged to put on the, the whole armor of God so that no part of us will be naked or exposed to the enemy. And um, so then it says, after you've done everything to stand, stand firm. And so uh, I heard a scholar, you know, say, um, having done all these stand, we must resolve not to yield to Satan. Uh, we must resist him. And if we, um, well, we must resist him. And we must, um, you know, if we dishonor um, or disobey or dishonor, I think, um, our cause or our God or our armor, then we give the enemy an advantage and a foothold into our lives. And so what that means is like, you know, when we're standing, we have to stand firm, being very rooted and grounded and not allowing any space for the enemy. And it says if we dishonor our cause, if we, if we for a moment, you know, let down our, um, our uh, uh, you know, let down our guard on our cause or waver, that's the word I was looking for, or waver on our cause, or if we waver in our belief, or if we waver um, in, a, in a protection of our armor, which are the things that we're going to talk about, it says that we give the enemy um, an advantage and a foothold into our lives. And so we must stand in, the, in our complete armor. That is the, you know, um, um, you know, stand in our complete armor. And so, oh, one of the other things I thought was interesting with that is that, you know, when they talk about putting on the full armor of God, all of that is, is stuff that's covering our front. I don't know if you guys noticed that, but I heard a preacher talk about that once. And, um, you know, he talked about how it was all things that covered our front. And there was nothing, you know, covering our back, which meant that, you know, God made, you know, meant for us to face the enemy head on and to face them, you know, and not turn our back on him. Because if we turn our back, then that leaves us exposed. And so when he talks about putting, in our, putting on our complete armor, you know, we're talking about the belt of truth, you know, buckled around our waist. We're talking about the breastplate of righteousness in place. We're talking about, you know, with our feet fitted with readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. We're talking about the shield of faith. We're talking about the helmet of salvation. We're talking about the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And so I want to talk about each of those, like I did last week, kind of dissect them and talk about each piece. Um, and so the first thing is the belt of truth buckled around our waist. And when we think about truth, you know, uh, truth is like, it, it's, well, we think even about a, be- a buckle. If we think about a buckle and how it girds, it holds up our pants, it kind of keeps things in place. And it's saying that truth is like our gird, you know, it's our girdle. It helps to keep things in place. Um, if you guys remember, I think the first week when I was talking about the tactics of the enemy, and I mentioned that um, one of his tactics is like lies and deception. Um, and I was saying that the only way that we could combat lies is with the truth. It, it sounds very simple, and it is. And so the way to combat lies is with the truth, and the truth is a part of us, a part of our armor as Christians. And so when you look at a lot of things that's going on, and you see how, um, how you know, how people um, are, are kind of loose with the truth and you know how they say tell little white lies and things like that. It's like the truth, you know, the truth is important, is an important part um, of our And if we move away from the truth, then, you know, we, again, we expose ourselves to the enemy. You know, if we begin to, um, to compromise in, in matters of truth, um, then we expose ourselves uh, to the enemy. You know, in John 14 and 6, Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Um, and in John uh, 4 and 24, you know, said God, God is spirit and we must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so truth is important, is an important part um, of our armor um, because that's, that's in what we, we're, we're girded up in. That's what helps us to, um, to be firm and to be, I guess, I want to say strong, 
and confident, you know, is in the truth of God's word. Um, and so the second thing it says, you know, that we are, uh, um, uh, we are to wear the breastplate of righteousness, you know, um, and the breastplate of righteousness, you know, righteousness in and of itself is about being morally upright and acting um, in accordance with, with divine or moral law. That's just a simple definition of what righteousness is. And in Luke 2 and 25, um, it, it talks about a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And it says that this man was righteous and devout. And it says, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And so when we're walking in right, righteousness, you know, the Holy Spirit is, a, is upon us. And when we're walking in righteousness, you know, it's like the Holy Spirit is leading us and guiding us in all truth and righteousness. And so when we're walking um, in righteousness, you know, that is a sign that the Holy Spirit is upon us because we can't walk in righteousness by ourselves, but it is only through the Spirit of God that allows us to be able to walk in true and full righteousness. Um, and so it says, put on a breastplate of righteousness. And the breastplate, you know, it protects your heart. So that's the, that's the piece of the equipment. That's the piece of the armor that goes across your chest and protects your heart. And so, you know, righteousness, you can say, protects our heart. When we're walking in righteousness, we're, we're, there's a protection of our heart that takes place because in righteousness, you know, you're, you're walking in truth and your, your heart is, you know, is protected because you're walking in righteousness. Um, and one of the scriptures, it says, you know, to guard your heart with all diligence for out of it flows the issues of life. And the heart is, it, it is, it, it's certainly, you know, in the natural as well as in the spiritual, it is one of those vital organs that's very, very important. Um, and when, we, when we're not walking in righteousness, I guess the opposite of righteousness would be wickedness. And if you're walking in wickedness, wickedness affects your heart. Even if you allow it in your space, it affects your heart. Um, and, and so even in these times when we're watching a lot of the stuff that, you know, we're watching in social media, a lot of stuff that's going on in the news, a lot of stuff that's going on in the world. Um, I talked about it, I think, um, a couple of weeks ago when I was talking about all the natural disasters, I was saying that, you know, this is a time and an era where people are very mean and there's a lot of anger and a lot of hatred in the world. And that will pierce your heart. If you allow the enemy to pierce your heart with anger and hatred and evil and all of that, it could really... Um, you know, it could really harm your life, you know, it can harm your life. Um, and so my, 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 I encourage you to not allow the enemy, you know, to pierce your heart with hatred and anger, but to respond to everything that you're saying, respond to it in love, respond to it in peace, um, respond to it in prayer, um, and just, you know, guard your heart, you know. And, and like I said, it is one of the most vital organs, uh, not just in the spiritual, but in the natural as well. And so the third thing that, um, the third piece of equipment that we talk about, the third part of our armor, um, it says that our, you know, that um, to have our feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And when you think about your feet being fitted with readiness, you know, walking steady, you know, uh, with assurance of Christ, it, with the assurance of Christ and the gospel of peace, that helps you to stand firm. You know, if your feet um, are fitted with readiness that comes from a gospel of peace. It allows you to stand firm um, and not be easily um, moved. And it talks about, um, you know, one of the things I think about when I when I talk when I think about this is the fact um, that you know when we're when we're standing firm, then we're not easily um, provoked and we're not easily moved. And once we do become easily provoked or easily moved, you know that that leaves us unstable. It leaves us unstable or unstable. Um, and I thought about like times where you know, you know where, where you allowed your peace to be shaken, um, and you're not as confident, you're not as firm, you're not as flat-footed and and um, and dug in. And when you when that happens, you know you may find yourself um, just kind of completely off balance, and you know you find yourself in a situation where you've been offended, um, um, and then you know just it kind of causes you to act completely out of your character and in fact stealing your you're stealing your peace and so it talks about being uh, fitted with the with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace and in peace there is stability like when you think about a, when you think about when you're walking in peace there is such confidence there your steps are firm your steps are you know um, 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 directed like there is a very real stability that comes when you're walking in peace. Um, and in battle, 
you know, you must be stable. You know, you have to be balanced, you know, spiritually, mentally, physically, emotionally, you have to be balanced. Um, yeah, you have to be balanced and you have to be balanced with the God. And that balance comes from the gospel of peace. That comes from what God has said. It comes from the peace of God and the truth and the peace of God. Um, a few weeks ago, I actually watched this movie. I think it was called, um, I think it was Hacksaw Ridge. And it was about, uh, it was actually a, a true story about a World War II Army uh, medical uh, that um, Desmond Doss. And the story was about Desmond Doss and how he was um, a conscientious, objector and he decided that he or refused not decided but refused to carry um, a weapon while in battle because he didn't want to kill people and so he became one of the first men in america uh, in american history to receive a medal of honor you know without uh firing a shot that's really you know that's huge um but it's estimated that you know he went to world war ii or fought in world, world war ii and it was estimated that even without having a weapon that he was able to save, I think he said like 50, the other soldiers said like 100, so they just kind of put it in the middle and said he saved like 75 people, um, but what I found so interesting um, about that is uh, he was literally, you know, rescuing them and, and lowering them down off of this um, this ridge or this, this mountain, I guess it was a ridge, but he was lowering them down, and um, they said, you know, with every person that he rescued, he just continued, you know, to pray. Lord, please just help me get one more. Just help me get one more. And so that's an example of what it looks like, um, you know, to be really rooted. I guess that's probably an even better way to say it. You know, when you think about your feet, fit it with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. It means that you're rooted, like you are, you are stable. And that's just a real example um, of how someone can be so stable and established in the gospel that they're even able to go not just to spiritual combat, but to go to actual physical war um, and still be able to do, uh, you know, do some great things, just being rooted in a gospel of peace. And so the fourth piece of armor that we talk about, it says um, to take up the shield of faith with, with, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So the shield of faith, um, in fact, I'll, I'll tell you, one of my favorite uh, superheroes is Wonder Woman. I always love when she, like, have – well, I guess she has a bracelet. She didn't really have the shield. But I love that, you know, how she had the bracelet. And that was kind of like a shield for her because she would use it to kind of block darts and bullets and all that stuff. Um, but it, number four tells us to take up the shield of faith, which uh, can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Um, and so it says the shield of faith, you know, faith is our shield. Our faith is our shield. Our faith is what protects us um, from all of the, fly, the flaming arrows that the enemy throws our way. Um, and, you know, it, and shields are used as a protective, um, a protection mechanism, um, you know, and it's and actively, you know, so you have to, you have to move the shield in order to block. You're not just passively standing there waiting for it to see what happens, but you are blocking everything that's coming your way. All the darts that the enemy throw, you are actively blocking on um, those those darts and those arrows, um, and these arrows. In the case when you're talking about uh, the enemy, you're talking about spiritual warfare. The arrows that we're talking about are the fiery arrows that the enemy throws our way. And we've talked about some of these things um, when I talked about the tactics of the enemy. Um, and some of the arrows that the enemy throw our way is like lies, um, deception, discouragement, unbelief. Um, offense, that's a huge one. I talked a little bit about that when I talked about, you know, being stable, and I talked about how um, if we're easily provoked and easily offended, how that can leave us off balance. And so offense is, is certainly one of those arrows that the enemy uses, but also confusion. Um, yeah, I'll just leave that one right there. <laughs> confusion. Um, and also disobedience. Disobedience is one of those things that the enemy uses, um, uh, arrows that the enemy uses as well. And so when an enemy shoots his darts um, at you, and he will, <laughs> you must counter with faith. You know, you must counter with faith thoughts and faith words and faith action. You must counter all the fiery darts of the enemy with faith, faith words, faith thoughts, and faith action. Um, and next, we talk about um, taking the helmet of salvation. Now, as I imagine, you know, just putting on, and as I'm talking about it, I'm like in my mind's eye, 
like putting on all of the armor as we're talking about it. And when I think about putting on a helmet of salvation, of course, the first thing that comes to mind is guarding your mind. And so the helmet protects your head, which, of course, houses, the, you know, another vital organ, which is your mind. Um, Joyce Myers wrote this really cool book many years ago. Actually, I think I've had that book over 20 years, probably. Um, but she wrote this book um, called Battlefield of the Mind. And, you know, the idea of the book is that most of the battles that we encounter takes place in our mind. So, you know, a lot of times as believers, when we're thinking about spiritual warfare, we're talking about being battle ready. Um, a lot of times it's not even about the physical fight as much as it's about the spiritual fight. And so in Joyce Meyer's book, Battlefield of the Mind, that's what she's talking about. She's talking about how the things that take um the, the battles that take place in our minds, the things that arrest us mentally, and how that can um, um, uh, uh, disable us spiritually, how it can disable us physically when you think about things like that. So some of the things that um, take place in our mind um, is worry. We talked a lot about that. Um, doubt, uh, fear. Um, we talked about confusion uh, earlier. Um, depression. I did I think a two-part series last season on depression and anxiety. Depression is one of those things that, you know, the battle starts in our mind. Anger is another one. Um, and condemnation, just this feeling of I messed up, I can't, be rec I can't recover, I can't be forgiven, all of those things, like those feelings of condemnation is also, um, uh, you know, one of those things that uh, kind of arrests our mind. Um, one of the quotes that Joyce Myers says in her book, she says, you can't have a positive life and have a negative mind. So what that means is that, like I said, I think last week or a couple of weeks ago, um, that we have to think about what we think about. And in 1 Peter 1 and 13, it says, therefore, prepare your mind for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, so we have to guard our minds and we have to guard our thoughts. And I think it's interesting. And I think it was another quote that we used when it talked about being sober-minded. Um, I think that's when we were talking about uh, maybe confusion and talked about being sober-minded. And so in response to when I talked about the tactics of the enemy, um, I was saying what our response should be, you know, when an enemy attacks us with, um, you know, with different things, doubt and confusion and all that. Um, but this scripture tells us also to be sober in our mind. Um, and so, um, and, and also last week, I think it was last week, we talked about, um, you know, taking captivity and bringing or um, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Again, thinking about what you're thinking about. Um, and and that, that means literally taking hold of every thought, um, taking hold of every thought and bring it into the obedience of Christ. And we talk about the obedience of Christ, we're talking about lining it up with God's word. So the moment you have a thought, you know, you have to line it up with God's word. Um, and that brings us to our six, um, the sixth weapon that we're to, uh, or the sixth uh, piece of our armor um, is, is last last mentioned, but certainly not least um, of our weapon. And this is the, uh, the sword of the spirit, um, which is the word of God. And so, like I said, with the last one, we talk about, um, I'm sorry, putting on a helmet of salvation when we talked about that and we talked about, you know, thinking about what we're thinking about and taking captive of our thoughts and all of that and bring it into alignment with the truth of God's word. And so number six is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And so the sword of the spirit, that is our weapon. Like everything else is like our armor, but the sword of the spirit is our weapon. And it says that the sword of the spirit is the word of God. So the word of God is our weapon. Everything that the enemy throws our way. If you guys remember when I talked about Christ, um, last, or I guess I talked about that, that same when uh, the enemy tempted Jesus. I talked about that twice, uh, I think last week and maybe even the week before, which is kind of consistent thing throughout the series. But talking about the fact that, um, that the enemy tried to tempt Christ and everything that he said, Christ put the word on it. And so he, he said what, you know, it is written, it is written, you know, again, I say it is written, you know, he, that was Jesus' response to everything that the enemy tried to throw. He used the sword, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And so even if, if, if the word of God, if Christ is using the word of God, then we certainly must know that it is imperative that we too 
use the word of God to combat the attacks and the tricks of the enemy. Um, and so in any battle, again, whether you're talking a physical battle, a natural battle, um, <clears throat> you know, the weapon is, in this, is, a, is a necessary, um, is necessary um, and is a vital part of our battle, um, so in, especially in a physical. And so uh, what Desmond Doss did, you know, he didn't have a weapon, but he was certainly equipped for battle and, um, with the sword of the spirit, which was the word of God. Um, he showed us that a soldier could go to battle without a rifle, but we can't go to battle without the word of God. Um, so we must always be, um, you know, in order to be battle ready, you know, we have to have the word of God. We must know the word of God. We must be able to, to uh, throw the word of God back at all the darts and all the tricks and all the things that the enemy throw our way. We must be able to respond accordingly, you know, through the word of God, um, because that is our weapon. And I think that the enemy, one of his greatest tactics really uh, is to deceive us, you know, and he deceives not just believers, but especially those who are outside of the body of Christ. But a lot of people aren't in the body because they just don't believe that the word of God is true. And I've even talked with like believers who, um, you know, question different parts of scripture and, um, you know, kind of get into those discussions and those debates. And I always say that, um, you know, it's kind of dangerous because that is our weapon. You know, scripture tells us that that is our weapon. And so we're not using our weapon um, accurately, then the enemy can really deceive us and make us believe um, that God's word is not true. And so um, that, I, I would say that that's one of his greatest tactics is to deceive us and believing that God's word is not true. So, and I think last week and maybe even the week before, I talked about Adam and Eve, and I talked about how the enemy, you know, deceives them. Um, so that's what he does. Any way that he can deceive us, that's what he does. Um, and, and, uh, and I started to say that there are, you know, a lot of people, um, even in the faith, who question the very word of God. Um, and as a result, they don't have that weapon to aid them in battle. I could not imagine um, anybody, you know, I think um, uh, uh, Desmond Doss was kind of an anomaly in that. And I don't even know if people have, have done that since. Um, but he was kind of an anomaly in that he uh, went to battle without a weapon. But I could not imagine, especially in a spiritual battle, going to battle without my weapon, which is the word of God. And that's why I always encourage people to really study the word, um, study the word, stay in the word. Um, I always talk about, you know, uh, you know, that my best advice to believers is, you know, when you're in battle with no matter what the enemy is throwing your way, no matter what he's doing, the best thing that you can do for yourself in battle is put the word on it. Because like we learned, the word is our weapon. And without the word, you know, it's, it's very challenging and very difficult to fight against the enemy. And so one of the things I always would suggest is, you know, when you're going through anything, no matter what it is, find out what God said about it, uh, about that situation, and then find it in the scripture. That is the word. That is your weapon. Find it in the scripture and then put the word on it and, and, and say only what God says, you know, um, that's the best thing that you can do for yourself while in battle. So those were my thoughts on being battle ready and what that means and what it looks like looking at the uh, scripture found in Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Um, and one of the things that it ends up with, or that it, um, that it, it kind of, that scripture ends with, it says, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm. That is what we are expected to do when we are in battle. And to be battle ready, we have to have all of our armor. We have to have it on, we have to have it uh, ready to be used, and we have to know how to use it. I think last week, I think it was when I was talking about um, the sword of the spirit and how that's the word of God, and I think I said something to the effect that to the degree that we yield to the word of God is the degree that we are proficient in yielding or, yeah, yielding our sword or using our sword. Um, it's crazy. I just had like this incredible imagery of what that looks like. So I'll say it again. So to the degree that we are yielded to the word of God is the degree to which we are proficient in yielding our sword. And what that looks like, what God just put in my spirit to share with you guys, what that looks like is if the enemy um, comes against you <clears throat> with, you know, with suggestions of sickness or suggestions of condemnation, you know, you go and you look through the scripture and you see what the word says, you know, um, 
you know, uh, the, 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 uh, yeah, I'm free from the law of sin and death, sickness and disease. You know, you use that scripture against it. You know, if the enemy, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, gets you with, you know, suggestions of condemnation. You go to the scripture, you know, there's therefore now no condemnation. You know, you just go to, you use whatever God has already said about it. And you dig in your, your word, you dig in the word, you grab your weapon, which is the word of God, and you combat whatever the enemy is throwing your way with the word of God. So those are my thoughts on what it means to be battle ready. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, um, we're going to just kind of talk about, you know, that's so cliche, uh, I think I wanted to add it, that's so cliche, or is it? <laughs> so we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to you know, talk on the topic of that's so cliche. So we'll be right back. This is so cliche, or is it <laughs> um, cliche to talk about today? And so the cliche that I want to talk about is actually one of, it's one of my favorites. And I think I first came across this cliche when I was an undergrad. I think I was writing a paper or something. But this is so appropriate for what we're talking about tonight. And it says, uh, speak softly and carry a big stick. You know, uh, I love that quote so much. So the history behind that, it means that back up what you say with a show of strength. Um, and this term is a quotation from a speech by President Theodore Roosevelt on September the 2nd in 1901, in which he said that the country must keep on training a highly efficient Navy in order to back up the Monroe Doctrine. Um, it was often repeated and is by no means obsolete. Opera singer Renee Fleming referred to it in the inner voice um, in 2004, describing her manager. He is thoughtful and enormously has enormous integrity, is highly respected, and speaks softly, but carries a big stick. And so, I, like I said, I love that uh, that cliche. And I think it's very appropriate, you know, as we think about some of the things that we're seeing, um, you know, that's going on in the world today. Um, you know, even when you think about doing protests and all that stuff, 
you know, you can speak softly, you can, but let what you say be mightier and powerful. You know, you don't have to yell, you don't have to, um, you know, be belligerent and all that stuff, but you can make, as uh, Colin Ka Kaepernick has shown, you can make a huge impact by even just being silent, you know, you think about it, he's not really speaking out or saying anything, but he has made such a huge impact with his silent protest. And I think it's bringing, you know, a lot of attention um, and garnering, you know, a lot of support. So that is our, that's so cliche, speak softly, but carry a big stick. So that is our show, but I want to leave you guys with a couple of announcements. In fact, just really one announcement. I am super excited to announce that we will be having the State of the Faith Forum on this Saturday. That is Saturday, September the 30th, um, and it's from um, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., and it's going to be held at Transformation of Life Christian Center, located at 9633 uh, Liberty Road, H and J. And again, it's a free event. Um, it's from uh, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Please come out, join us, come out and, uh, you know, uh, have a, be a part of the discussion, uh, get your questions answered or ask your questions and get them answered. And we're going to be talking about very important issues such as uh, church attendance, you know, uh, church in the millennials, church hurt, church and community responsibility, church and finances. Um, plus a lot more. So I hope you guys have marked your calendars and plan to come out and join us. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys there. Thank you so much, as always, for tuning in and supporting Girlfriend Therapy Radio, for supporting FFP Media Network. I love you guys. So until next week, blessings.